All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us for tonight's Scleral Lens Education Society webinar titled Managing Scleral Lens Wear. I want to go ahead and uh, introduce our presenters tonight. Dr. Steve Vincent is an associate professor in the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, the Australian College of Optometry, and the British Contact Lens Association the Scleral Lens Education Society, and the Higher Education Academy. Dr. Vincent's research interests include visual optics of contact lenses and refractive air development. He has published over 80 scientific papers on these topics. Dr. Karen Lee, our current president of SLES, uh, received her Doctor of Optometry degree from Indiana University School of Optometry and completed a cornea and contact lens residency at Southern California College of Optometry. Prior to joining the University of Houston, Dr. Lee served as director of the Specialty Contact Lens Clinic at the University of, San of uh, California, San Francisco Ophthalmology Department. Dr. Lee is a member of the Texas Optometric Association, the American Optometric Association, and the Ocular Surface Society. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, president of the Scleral Lens Education Society and a GPLI advisory board member. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Lee. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I know things are really hectic and everyone's really busy right now. And so we'll try to keep it brief and to the point. Um, we're talking about managing scleral lens wear today. These are our disclosures. Um, the main things that we're wanting to focus on is, you know, application removal, because it is so important to make sure our patients are doing it properly. Care and maintenance, especially with, you know, all the coronavirus and whatnot that's going on right now. And we're going to talk about, you know, some different complications that you may see and just how to troubleshoot those issues. So starting off with application and removal is probably one of the most important things with all of our patients at this moment because if you really look at the information and the research that's being published the majority of your patients who will stop wearing their scleral lenses they're going to stop because they say that they're too difficult to put on or take off and so if we really think about it, if your lens is fitting beautifully and it looks perfect, if your patient can't handle it properly, they're not going to be able to use it successfully. Looking at the study that was published from Boston site, they actually looked at all of their patients and they found that it, with proper training, regardless of age and diagnoses, patients should be able to get their lenses on within a short amount of time by the fifth week of them wearing it. Personally, the youngest patient I've ever trained was age five, and the oldest person I've trained was age 95. And so I kind of used those numbers to um, try to, you know, uh, motivate my patients that are struggling. This is a really hilarious video that we wanted to show you all. Let's see if I can get it to play here. Are we on? Recording, yes, we are on. I'm going to take this. I'm going to put it in my eye. Take this contact out. You may want to get in close for this. Oh, man. Oh, it's an XD. Oh, that's stuck. Oh, that's stuck. Did it come out? I believe so. Yep. I, I heard it. Yeah, where'd it go? Oh, no, it's still in there. I heard a massive pop. That's all I know. All right, cut. This is not going to work. <laughs> So just from watching that video alone, you know, there's several different things that this patient's doing wrong. First of all, I mean, he's using the wrong plunger. He's putting it in a poor place. It just really looks like he's trying to enucleate himself. And at the end of all that, he still doesn't get the lens out. And so let's make sure we avoid that. Some useful resources that I like to use in my clinic is I direct everyone to the Scleral Lens Education Society YouTube page, where there's a 10 minute long video um, and it starts with this girl right here, the, this brunette. And basically in that video, they go over all of the different ways you should be handling the lenses and the different solutions they can use. There's also a really good um, FAQ on the website at sclerolens.org. And we also worked on a similar FAQ that's available on GPLI. So I would definitely check those out and consider 
printing out some copies or some brochures to have in your office. Other things to think about is just, you know, look at your patient. If you look at their hands and you're seeing that they're really shaky or they have really bad arthritic joints or they're missing digits, the first thing I would do is just hand them the plunger and see if they can even handle holding it or squeezing it properly. Um, from there, you know, I also look at the palpebral fissure size. If it's a very narrow palpebral fissure, I'm not gonna try to fit a large diameter lens. I'm probably gonna start with like a 15.5 or a 16.0. Um, if it's a larger palpebral size, then sure, let's go bigger if we need to, right? And of course, eyelid tension. If it's really tight eyelids, patient's gonna really struggle. I'm probably gonna go with something a little bit smaller too. And so think about all these different things as you're looking at your patient. When you start with the application and removal training process, uh, this is a very typical setup that I like to do. I really enjoy having two mirrors, one laying flat on the bottom and one um, on a little mirror stand like that. So it allows the patient to either be looking straight ahead, that's what they're comfortable with, or they can tuck their chin down and they can be looking down towards the mirror on the table if they're more comfortable doing that. Um, typically, if I am also going to be selling plungers from my office, I will buy everything from Amazon or the dry eye shop and I will you know, have all this in my office ready to go. Or of course, dmvcorp.com has a lot of plungers that we can use too. The most traditional method of putting lenses on would be starting with the application plunger or the plunger method. This is probably the easiest way to start um, because they don't have to worry about balancing the lenses on their fingers. Some things that I think about is if my patient has really bad unaided VAs, I may reach for an orange plunger so they have an easier time seeing it as opposed to the light blue one. Um, I also want to make sure that my patients are properly managing their plungers. And so I recommend that they rub them with an alcohol pad every night, or at least rinse with some multi-purpose solution before allowing it to air dry. And they should be release, replacing these plungers a few times a year. As your patients get more advanced, they can try to get rid of the plunger completely and switch to the tripod method where they're purely balancing the lens on their fingers. Um, this tends to be a little bit more difficult because once you fill that lens with solution, it's really easy to topple over. And it's really important that your patient has clean fingers, otherwise front surface wetting of this lens is just not gonna be great. But the nice thing is, is if they ever need to take their lens off and they don't have their plunger around, they can do it, they can get it right out of the eye. There's a lot of different application tools out there that can be helpful for the patient who just truly can't handle holding the plunger or maybe they have really tight eyelids with narrow fissures and they need both hands to open their eyelids. The plunger stand, was, which is the third picture right there, um, is really helpful so that they don't have to worry about their shaky hands, they have both hands to open the eyelids. The Easy Eye scleral lens applicator kind of reminds me of like a ring pop, but for scleral lenses. And so patients can just balance it on there and put it right on. The orthodontic dental band or the O-ring, this is, you know, those rubber bands that we used to use if you had braces to help you realign your jaw. So you can easily just, you know, buy a packet of those and use that and it's clean and it's disposable. If your patient wants a more high-end type of system, Dalsy Adaptives has this really great sea green lens inserter. Um, it has a green LED light that actually attaches to the base of the plunger, and so that way patients can actually see what they're doing. Um, this is one of my more, I guess, inspirational patients. He's truly born with just two digits, and he's able to remove his plunger or remove his scleral lens without any help. And so, you know, what I tell my patients that are really struggling is it's, a lot of it's really just mental. Like if they can really, you know, continue practicing, coming in for training and find the best technician you have in your office and teach them how to do it. And if that person can go ahead and teach all your patients, your patients are gonna be so much more successful with all of this. When it comes time to remove the lenses, Again, I recommend starting with plungers to begin with. DMV has three different plungers that are really useful. The Ultra is the you know, classic plunger that we think of that you just place on the periphery part of the scleral lens. If your patient you know, really needs to be seeing what they're doing, consider using the DMV 45, which is slightly slanted. 
so that it doesn't block their line of sight. If I have a patient that's maybe post-PK or post-corneal cross-linking, and I'm worried about like a weakened epithelium or I don't want to tug on sutures, I may reach for the DMV Classic, which is a fenestrated plunger in the middle. So patients can squeeze the um, shaft of the plunger and not you know, create too much suction and I don't have to worry about them tugging on the eye. And so ideally, I usually tell my patients, just aim for where the color part of the eye meets the white, either at six or 12. And if you can, you know, just aim it right off, off center like that, that lens should come off without making that really scary popping noise that we saw in the video. As your patients get better, they can, you know, slowly shed the removal plunger as well, and they can try to remove the lens with the finger. So it's almost like the watermelon seed removal method with GP lenses. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, is if the overall diameter of the lens is really large, it's really difficult to pull the eyelids apart all the way. Um, other things that may be helpful would be to just have your patient massage by the lens edge. And as you're massaging and you indent that congen sclera, usually you can get a little air bubble to form. And once that air bubble forms underneath that lens, it's gonna break that seal. Also consider just using preservative-free artificial tears and that will kind of help loosen things up too so that removal with the plunger will be easier. I really love these handouts from Bausch.com. Um, if you call them, they will actually send you pads of this so you can just tear it off one side of the paper has the plunger method. On the back side of that paper has the finger method for application and removal. Every single new patient takes one of these home with them, um, and it's just really, really helpful and easy for us to use in office. The next thing we usually talk about with our patients are the different solutions that they should be using. And, you know, we have to make it really clear that there's three different types of solutions typically, right? There's your cleaning solution, your storage solution, and then your filling solution, the solution that should go into the lens before they put it on the eye. And so when it comes to filling solutions, we tend to have three or four different options. Your classic is the non-preserved saline or the Adipax. This is off-label use. A lot of times I send my patients to Amazon to get it, or if they wanna to try to use their insurance, they can go ahead and go to like a Walgreens or CVS, but that will require you to write a prescription. There's also FDA approved versions, which is Lacropure, Sclerophyll, and the newest version, which is Nutrafil from Contamac. Nutrafil is really exciting. I'm you know, getting excited to use it as well because it's supposed to have electrolytes and things like that to help nourish the eye. And so it's not just you know sodium and saline and all of that. There's also PuriLens, which used to be the old Unisol 4. And so all of these are you know, good options that you can use to fill with. Here we just have a little table breaking down you know, on the little things here that are minor differences between the three. The only thing I will point out is if I am working a workers comp case where I feel like maybe I would be called to court to somehow defend you know, why this patient needed scleral lenses, I tend to reach for more FDA approved filling solutions than going off label because I'm just gonna be really by the books in that case. This is just an example of how you could write a prescription for Walgreens um, for off label use of the inhalation solution or the Adipax. Just be prepared for the pharmacist to still call you because they're gonna call and be like, hey, this is supposed to be used for asthma inhalers. Are you sure we're gonna be using it on the patient's eyeball? and just tell them, yep, off-label use, please fill as written. When it comes to cleaning um, with the different solutions, you know, always tell your patients that they have to physically rub. It's really important unless uh, you are using a peroxide-based solution. And that really is the only preservative-free option at the moment, which I really like because it does a great job of cleaning and then it's really gentle once it's completely neutralized. Um, because these lenses are made of high DK, you know, breathable GP materials, they also tend to be kind of soft and they can get scratched up pretty easily. So try to avoid anything that looks milky that may have silica gel beads in it because that is going to scratch your patient's lenses up and they won't last as long. And um, again, always educate your patient that regardless of whatever cleaning solution they're using, they want to rinse really, really well with saline before they put the lenses on their eye. 
And all of these are really good. Just remember, avoid any red cap solutions because that's going to just prematurely rub off any hydropeg or plasma coatings that you may have on there. Um, and when we think about peroxide solutions, we always know that there's that neutralizing case. Uh, one thing that doctors have pointed out is with the new clear care with Hydroglide, they're noticing like a filmy residue. If, you, if your patient is experiencing that, just tell them to go out and find original clear care and it just kind of, the problem goes away. Other things to think about is if you're fitting a large diameter scleral like 18 millimeters or 19 millimeters, sometimes the case that comes with the solution just doesn't seem big enough, right? That basket just looks really small on the scleral lens. You can always go to dryeyeshop.com where they make this really, really large pros disinfection case. This case can fit a lens that's as big as 24 millimeters. So you don't have to worry about them breaking it or anything like that. The only thing that you have to remember is the bottom of the case doesn't come with the neutralizing disc. So if your patient needs a large case like this, they're still going to have to go out and purchase clear care, but they're going to physically remove the neutralizing disc from the clear care case and pop it onto the bottom of the pros disinfection case, and then they're good to go. Usually what I tell my patients to do is go buy four bottles of travel size clear care. That gets them four clear care cases. Each neutralizing disc is good for about 90 days. So four clear care cases should last them the full year. There's a lot of additional cleaners that your patient may wanna use as well to help them remove you know, heavy deposits and whatnot. Menicon Progen is an amazing cleaner that we love using in office. The only thing to remember here is one, it does come with a special scleral lens basket, so you can go ahead and order that if you need it. And two, if you have any hydropeg on your lens, the Progen is going to absolutely remove it completely. This is a nice resource from AOCLE.org. I haven't been able to find a tear, tear pad version of this, but I do print it out. Um, it's really, really clear about the different solutions that you can use. And another nice thing is it comes in three different languages on the website. So we have just a huge stack of this in both English and Spanish, and we just fill it out for um, every new scleral lenswear that comes into our office. All right, uh, we do have one question here, actually. And basically, yeah. it, it it relates to the clear care diameter that you find doesn't fit in the standard clear care case, or do you have a? Um, I think different practitioners have different recommendations. I usually say like if it's 17 or larger, then I try to go towards the bigger one. In all honesty, the clear care case can handle probably even an 18 diameter lens, but you have to tell your patient to not close the basket so that it snaps. If they just gently bring the basket down and they don't snap it together, they'll be fine. I just find that most patients get really like excited to remove their lens and they just push too hard and crack their lens right in the middle. Good question. I think that's all we have for now. We'll take some more questions at the end as well. Okay, awesome, awesome. So let's keep going for now. So now we're gonna talk about um some of the complications you might encounter during scleral lens wear and starting with the post lens tear layer, so uh, bubbles to begin with. So one common situation that arises um, particularly in new lens wearers is a, a significant application bubble. So this is a large central bubble and this causes a lot of issues obviously in terms of poor vision and if the lens remains on eye, corneal desiccation and uh, discomfort. So the management of that is really the lens has to come out, be refilled and uh, reapplied to the eye. So the, the issue here typically is the bowl hasn't been filled sufficiently with the application fluid or when it's being applied by the patient or the doctor, um, you've sort of collected the, the eyelid or the lashes on the way in so you really need to work on the insertion. Late forming bubbles, so when you see a patient for an aftercare or even during the fitting process, you're starting to see some bubbles enter the uh, the reservoir. This is typically due to misalignment between the landing zone of the lens and the underlying sclera. So 
In those cases, we need to think about are the bubbles causing a problem for the patient in terms of vision and comfort, and do we need to modify the fit of the landing zone to really seal off the system so we're not getting those bubbles in there. Of course, we do have um, one situation where we do want a bubble in the reservoir, and that's when we um, uh, fit a fenestrated scleral lens. So we have a fenestration specifically to allow an air bubble into the system. And we want that to be a small air bubble that's mobile and it can move around in the reservoir close to the limbus and potentially provide some more oxygen for the cornea. A good tip for your late forming bubbles is to have the um, optimally fitted lens on the eye or the lens that the patient's wearing and then dose the eye with uh, your fluorescein or lysamine green. These are some nice images from Tom Arnold here. And this will just help to identify any areas of misalignment in the landing zone. So you just follow the fluid or follow the bubbles if you can see the bubbles. And that's gonna show you where you've got some standoff and maybe you need to, to flatten that down by going to a toric or a quadrant specific or a fully customized landing zone. So let's talk about some physiological complications now. We'll start with the conjunctiva and then we'll consider the, the cornea. So a common one is, is tissue compression in the, the landing zone. And a lot of people have reported on this and we certainly observe it in clinical practice. I mean, even with soft contact lenses, we do see um, some tissue compression in soft lens wearers and potentially a lot of conjunctival staining. And often those soft lens wearers are very happy. So does tissue compression really matter with, um, with scleral lenses? So research from our laboratory has shown um, using OCT imaging that about 70% of the compression is pretty superficial. So it's at the conjunctival level. And the remaining 30% is, uh, is the sclera being compressed. So I think it does matter in terms of um, you know, appearance and comfort. So if the patient's reporting that they have discomfort, if there's obvious vascular changes in the superficial tissue, if there's a lot of staining, that needs to be investigated. If you have a lot of compression in, in one quadrant, you know, this might start to affect the fit or centration of the lens. And certainly there's been a lot of work coming out in the last few years around uh, changes in IOP during scleral lens wear. And potentially this could be related to um, you know, how much compression we're inducing underneath the landing zone. So that's what we need to keep in mind. So what do we typically see? So we, we really, if you don't have OCT imaging, um, we're just relying on our clinical observation at the slit lamp. And we're looking for changes in the vasculature adjacent to the landing zone and, and underneath the landing zone as well. So what we're looking for is injection and blanching of the vessels. So compression, compression to the point where the vessels are basically being squashed and we're not seeing anything. So in this image here, we have, uh, you can see the edge of the lens, you can see the um, edge of the, the cornea, we've got a little bit of injection next to the limbus and then some blanching towards the edge of the lens. So this is often observed along the horizontal where the sclera is fatter, is flatter rather than fatter. <laughs> and um, this is uh, typically what's happening when we're fitting a, um, a spherical landing zone, so a rotationally symmetric landing zone to a toric or a, an asymmetric scleral surface, which is typically the case. So in these scenarios, we need to think about do we need to customize the landing zone or could we fit a smaller uh, or a larger overall diameter in this case? And so the next few slides, we're just going to talk through some, some different appearances, but basically the, the situation in, in all of these images is the um, sum of the peripheral curves or the curve most peripherally towards the edge of the lens is sort of landing too harshly, so it's too steep effectively and needs to be flattened off to reduce the amount of compression. So in this example here, we have what we call mid-peripheral compression. So we have, you can see the cornea, we've got some fluorescein which is extending beyond the cornea, so we've got good um, corneal clearance. We then have some injection um, surrounding uh, the limbus. Then we have a region of compression where the vessels are disappearing and then they reappear towards the edge of the lens. So this is sort of the, I guess, the, the mid-peripheral or the middle curves of the landing zone that are coming down too harshly on the underlying tissue and they need to be flattened out to remove that compression. 
In this scenario here, we have what we call edge compression. So we have uh, clearance at the limbus. We've got some injection surrounding the limbus. We have uh, some uh, compression or blanching of the vessels all the way out to the edge of the lens. So this is sort of our, our peripheral curves right towards the edge of the lens coming down too harshly. We then see we've got some injection adjacent to the, the lens as well. So again, um, these need to be uh, flattened out or potentially widened to have a, a smoother transition um, to that underlying ocular surface. In this scenario here, we have uh, what we call edge impingement, impingement, where the very edge of the lens is really coming down um, quite harshly on the underlying conjunctiva. And if you have an elevated area of conjunctiva, you may start to see some, um, some serious impingement, or in this example, this photo from Karen up the top here, we're starting to see some tissue roll back over onto the uh, anterior surface of the lens. So in this scenario, the, the outermost peripheral curve the very edge of the lens is coming down uh, too harshly and is interacting with the underlying conjunctiva. In the OCT image at the bottom, uh, we had this similar issue with a patient with a, a pterygium, and so we've put a, a notch in that lens to avoid that situation. Other approaches you could take to, to manage that is to potentially fit a smaller overall diameter or try and um, customise that area of the landing zone by putting in a vault to, to elevate over that lesion. Okay, so now we're going to move to the cornea, and certainly this is an area that where a, a lot of research has been done, and it's something that we're very mindful of because we're fitting a very thick uh, scleral lens, we've got the post lens tear layer, we typically don't have uh, much tear exchange at all, so the dynamics of oxygen flow to the cornea are obviously very different in, in scleral lens wear. So you can look for this in clinical practice obviously as you would for, um, for any contact lens wearing patient. Just looking at the slit lamp, looking for obvious signs such as neovasc, um, corneal clouding, but we typically don't get that until there's a reasonable amount of corneal edema going on. Um, in work that we've done in our laboratory, we've found that most sort of healthy patients with good endothelial function, they typically get about 1 to 2% edema throughout the day, and this is with high DK lenses of 100 DK or more. And that's sort of comparable to what we get in a number of um, uh, current soft hydrogel disposable lenses. So things you want to think about, if you have a patient who um, you're kind of hesitant to fit them in a scleral but it's really what they need, so um, thinking here cases where you've got a compromised endothelium such as post-penetrating uh, keratoplasty, patients with um, uh, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, maybe you want to do a scleral lens challenge where you, you fit them with the trial lens in office, you have them wear the lens for a period of time, and then you just re-examine the cornea, see if there's any changes in their, in their vision, see if there's any obvious edema. Um, you know, if you have an OCT or a pentacam, you can image how much um, corneal thickness has changed uh, during that scleral lens trial. Of course, during that, um, if we can just go back one slide. Sorry Karen, about that. That's all right. <laughs> if, um, if you do go ahead and, and fit the patient, of course, you want to optimise how much clearance you have. Um, we want to minimise that, but we do realise that it's not going to be possible across the entire cornea, particularly if you're fitting an advanced cone or a, a graft. You want to minimise the lens thickness if possible, or not always possible due to the, um, the power of the lens that you require and keeping in mind lens flexure as well. We do want to optimise the lens material fitting 100 DK or more if possible. Uh, some recent studies have shown that going you know, significantly beyond 100 DK doesn't make a huge difference. We can fenestrate as we have discussed, um, decreasing wearing time, potentially not an option for many patients you're fitting with sclerals because they, they need these lenses for functional vision. And if you start to see um, uh, vascular changes such as the neovasc in these images, you want to think about is the patient actually sleeping in these lenses because that's typically when we start to see significant um, vessels entering the cornea. 
So let's move away from physiological onto some optical complications you may encounter. We're going to go through a couple here, lens decentration, flexure, and um, front surface corrections for residual aberrations. There is a paper that uh, I published with Daddy Fidel available online uh, late last year, uh, which goes through a lot of these issues in, in great detail, and I'm happy to provide that for anyone who's interested. But let's talk about decentration first. So if you fit a, a, a standard rotationally symmetric spherical uh, scleral lens onto most eyes, so most um, scleros which are non-rotationally symmetric, we will get lens decentration and the lens typically drops down and out. And uh, you can see that just with the slit lamp here, we've got an OCT image and a pentacam image showing that you get changes in the, the, uh, the uniformity of the post lens tear layer. And you may potentially get some superior mid-peripheral bearing, which can be an issue as well. So really this just arises due to gravity and the, the alignment with, of the lens with the underlying sclera. So uh, potential issues are, yeah, physical changes to the cornea, so bearing on the cornea potentially leading to staining. Optical effects, of course, if we have a decentered lens, we do get some induced astigmatism and higher order aberrations such as coma. If you're fitting patients with a scleral lens in one eye only, which is sometimes the case if they've just had one, one eye grafted, and the lens is decentering. They are going to have um, typically vertical diplopia, which they may not be able to uh, to fuse. So that may need to be uh, addressed with spectacles or modifying the fit of the lens. So strategies to minimise lens decentration: try and optimise the fit of the lens with the uh, the underlying sclera. So you need to think about: do I need a toric or a, a customised haptic, so quadrant specific or, or totally customised? Can you reduce the lens diameter to move it away from that more peripheral asymmetric sclera closer to the limbus? And for vertical decentration, we have found that if you decrease the central clearance, so try and um, uh, adjust your fit to minimise the thickness of the post lens tear layer, that can help with vertical decentration. Flexure is another common issue that arises, and this is where the, the lens is, is bending on the eye effectively. So it doesn't warp when it's off the eye, but when you place it on the eye, you're getting um, some, flex, for some flexing of the lens. So this is most easily observed if you can take a, a topography over the top of the lens on eye. You can see it with, uh, with keratometry as well. So you'll have a, an astigmatic um, over-refraction effectively. So the issue here is, uh, again, the alignment of the landing zone with the underlying sclera. So this particularly happens in cases where you have a very toric sclera and you're trying to fit a, uh, a rotationally symmetric um, uh, landing zone on your scleral lens. So things you can think about to uh, manage this, potentially reduce the lens diameter, improve the alignment of the landing zone with the underlying sclera. Some people think about increasing the thickness of the lens. In our lab, we've found that once you sort of get over a scleral tericity of about 200 microns, you do start to ramp up how much, um, how much anterior lens flexure you observe. So if you have something that can quantify how much uh, scleral tericity your patients have, that can guide you in your initial lens selection as well. So front surface corrections, uh, these are corrections that we may need to uh, address some optical issues that arise when we fit a lens to the eye. So really this happens when we're not getting lens flexure or warpage, so the, the lens is fine, the alignment is good, but it's when we put the lens on the eye and we neutralise that anterior corneal surface with our post lens tear layer, we have these uh, residual aberrations, so significant astigmatism that manifests or higher order aberrations such as spherical aberration and coma. So this is common in keratoc keratoconic patients or patients that have uh, a toric IOL that's been inserted to try and minimise their uh, post-operative astigmatism following a graft. So strategies to address this can be a front surface toric to try and minimise uh, residual astigmatism. So I'm not really going to go into that because the, the concept is really the same as fitting a front surface toric for a corneal GP. 
you can, uh, some manufacturers are now offering customised front surfaces, so a higher order aberration, customised correction on the front surface. To do that, you need something to, to quantify the residual aberrations in the eye like an aberometer, and the lens needs to be very stable on eye, so it needs to be a, a, a toric or a, a totally customised um, haptic zone. Or you can play with the asphericity or eccentricity of the front surface of the lens. So you can modify the, the shape of the front surface to try and control the amount of spherical aberration that you introduce into the eye. So let's talk about that, manipulating that front surface, the asphericity or the eccentricity. So really this is just trying to control spherical aberration. And there's been some papers published on this. Uh, this particular study that I'll talk about here was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology a few years ago where they used the PROS device and modified the front surface eccentricity. So they had zero, which was a, a spherical front surface, and then a gradually um, uh, additional flattening in the periphery with 0.3 to 0.8 eccentricities. They found that about one third of, of patients preferred an aspheric front surface, so it either showed an improvement in their visual acuity or subjectively they preferred it compared to a spherical front surface. In these eyes where patients preferred uh, an aspheric front surface lens, they were very highly aberrated, so they had much, much more spherical aberration compared to eyes who, who didn't want this. So this really works well for eyes that have a large degree of spherical aberration. If you don't have something to quantify that, like an aberometer, it is a little bit of um, sort of trial and error, bracketing, guesswork. Some practitioners do have trial lens sets with spherical and various um, aspheric front surfaces in their practice if they're fitting a lot of keratoconic patients. And it's important to remember, you know, um, this is going to be very patient dependent and potentially even different uh, correction required between the fellow eyes. Steve, I think this slide is so cool. I just wanted to comment on this real quick because when I was doing pros in San Francisco, like every single lens that we started with, we would start with a 0.3 eccentricity because that was what we found was like really helpful, right? And this was always the last thing that we would change. And so if we felt like, hey, this patient's coming in for Sjogren's or just really bad dry eye and we knew the ocular surface shape was pretty normal, we would tend to try to drop the eccentricity down to see if vision would improve further, as opposed to if it was like, you know, advanced keratoconus, I would try to bump that 0.3 up to a 0.6. And I was so sad when I left pros because I thought, oh, I'll never get to do this again. But you're totally right. Like if you talk to your consultants, they will totally let you play with the eccentricity if you just tell them what you're dealing with. So I think this slide is so cool that you put it in here. Yeah, that's right, and uh, and you know the lenses we uh, typically use in our lab, I think uh, 0.3 is the default for the front surface as well. So yeah, you know manufacturers can do this for corneal GPs, and they can do it for your for your sclerals also. What's super exciting is a number of manufacturers are starting to look into customised um, wavefront guided front surface corrections. So this is just like your wavefront guide is LASIK basically. So you, you do need a way to um, measure the residual aberrations on eye. So the situation is, you know, you've, you've fitted your patient, they're still not getting optimal vision, um, you have ruled out lens flexure, and you think there's some higher order optics at play here. So with the best fitting lens on eye, you measure those aberrations with an aberometer, that can be sent to the manufacturer, and the correction can be, you know, lathed onto the front surface for that specific set of aberrations that you send them. So previous work had shown that this works well in, in keratoconic patients where those aberrations manifest once you correct the, the front um, surface of the cornea. So it's really arising from the posterior cornea. And vision would improve from, um, you know, 2050 to 2030, 2025, not quite as good as age match normals, but some recent work um, has shown that after a period of adaptation, so maybe there's some neural um, adaptation that has to go on, patients are getting um, very good vision close to, you know, uh, 2015, what we'd expect in, in young normal patients. So this is just an overview of the concept of how a, a customised front surface works. So we've got some wavefront error maps here in different situations and the simulated retinal image quality underneath. So here we've got a, a keratoconic eye 
from someone we've seen in our clinic, and that's their wavefront when they're not wearing any any spectacles or contact lenses. We fit them in spectacles, and we um, improve that wavefront. So we're improving retinal image quality. We've corrected the um, you know the defocus and the astigmatism with our specs, but we haven't addressed any of those higher order aberrations. We then fit them in a conventional. Uh, scleral lens, so our standard scleral lens, and we improve the vision even more because we're correcting that anterior front surface and all those higher order aberrations that are arising from the irregular uh, keratoconic front surface of the cornea. But now we have manifestation of the coma from the back surface, so we've got a, a change in the sign of the coma. And so if we measure that, quantify those aberrations, send that to the lab, get a customized lens made, we can improve that retinal image quality even further and reduce that magnitude of, of vertical coma. So that's the idea. Steve, I have a quick question. So hmm. like at the University of Houston, we have an aberrometer, but I feel like that's a special fancy piece of equipment that not everyone has. Hmm. So if I'm a doc that wants to try this, right? Um, if I have done everything, my over refraction is like Plano, nothing helps. If I try to t change the eccentricity and that next lens comes, do mm. I expect like an over refraction now or would it still be Plano, just vision would be better? Yeah, it depends. So if you've changed the um, eccentricity, the only thing you're sort of dabbling with there is a spherical aberration. So you may get a small change in the over refraction depending on what the pupil size is for the patient. Um, if you don't have an aberrometer though, you, you're going to struggle to correct things like coma, any of the other sort of higher order terms. It's really just spherical aberration when you're playing with the, the eccentricity. So in a case like this, where we have a cone and the main issue is vertical coma, we really need to quantify that somehow. So it can be a, a wavefront aberrometer, which is gonna measure the optics in the, the whole eye, or if you have a, a pentacam, you can uh, quantify the aberrations on the back surface of the cornea. So they're, they're sort of your options. If you can um, either, Play with the play with the eccentricity to try and optimize the um, spherical aberration, but failing that, if it's if it's coma, you, you need to quantify it with an aberrometer or something that can image the back surface of the cornea at least. Okay, awesome. So another optical challenge, which probably about one third of patients or more complain about is uh, the debris, the gunk, the buildup that happens in the reservoir, so midday fogging. So this is typically, you know, you see it in some patients as soon as they put the lens on eye, you see it starting to form. Many patients complain about it affecting their vision sort of a few hours after lens wear. They feel they have to take the lens out, rinse it, you know, refill, reapply, and maybe a few times throughout the day if they're wearing the lenses for most of the day. Etiology is not well known. It's thought to be associated with, you know, um, uh, lid hygiene, gland issues, or you've got uh, most likely some sort of edge lift somewhere around the landing zone, and we're getting debris um, exchange from the external environment coming into the, the post lens tear layer. And what you'll see is that murky tear film in the post lens tear layer on the slit lamp, or if you have an OCT, you'll see a lot of particles uh, in the reservoir. So how can we address this? Obviously, you know, before you start anyone on uh, on contact lens where you want to try and address ocular surface disease or, or lid disease as best as possible, but the uh, the scleral lens may be trying to treat the ocular surface disease in some cases. Some people have found reducing the limbal clearance uh, does really help. Um, you know, really end stage cases, trying a a soft lens underneath the scleral seems to help. Um, I've never tried that myself. I have gone down the path of trying to come up with a concoction uh, in the uh, application solution, so you know, using something more viscous to try and stop uh, other fluid getting into the post lens tear layer. Of course, proving, improving the, uh, the alignment of the landing zone is going to help as well. Ultimately, many patients will just have to remove the lens throughout the day, uh, rinse, clean, and you know, reinsert. Sometimes that is uh, unavoidable. One note I want to add on here is the new solution, Neutrophil, one of the things they mentioned in January was when they um, they released it into the world at GSLS, they said 
that that solution may actually help with midday fogging. I haven't had enough experience with it to, you know, say for certain, but it may help some people, right? I mean, you never know. Um, another common complication that we run into, I, I literally ran into this in, cl in clinic today, is poor lens surface where it's just not wetting very nicely. And I always tell my patients, it's like you have a dirty windshield. Um, all kinds of things can get stuck to the front of the lens. And so in this case here, this patient, if you look really closely, you see there's actually glitter and it's this is mascara from her um, eyelashes all over that contact lens. And they never really believe me. And so just like what I did with the patient today, I took out some OcuSoft baby lid scrubs and I you know, took all her makeup off from around the eye and flushed her eye a little and it did improve. But there are times where you know, even that's not enough. And patients will say like, no matter what I do, it just looks really filmy. Sometimes blinking helps, but I end up having to take my lenses off and clean them all day long. And there's lots of different sources that you know may be causing this. Maybe it's just an old lens and there's lots of scratches on the front surface, so it's not smooth anymore and things are just clinging to it more easily. Maybe they just have like a really bad tear film, right? Um, a lot of times with sclerals, if you're treating someone with a poor tear film, you're just kind of trading like one dry surface for another. So now that we're bathing the cornea in um, this protective fluid, well, the front surface of the lens still has that, you know, junk tear film. And so the front surface of that lens is just going to get really dry. And so um, they may just have to take the lens off and clean it. Now, depending on what it is, and it could be all of these different things here from makeups to different soaps, and maybe they're just not cleaning it properly at all. Like I couldn't figure out what this white stuff was on the front of this patient's lens, but it would just happen all the time. Um, and so some of the solutions that we try is, first of all, if you see any lid disease or you know ocular surface problems, you have to treat that and manage it um, during or before the fitting, even if possible. You want to review all the different types of, you know, makeups and lotions they're using. I still will use my Tyler's Quarterly on the back page. It has those contact lens approved makeups and I photocopy that and give it to the patient. Um, you can also try to just moisten a cotton tipped applicator or plunger and have them rub the front surface of their lens with it, almost like a windshield wiper. Think about changing up the solutions that they're currently using. Um, if you think it's a plasma treatment issue, you can usually send your sclerals back in and get them replasma treated. Just bear in mind, after around the third plasma treatment, uh, your lenses tend to get brittle, so you may just have to completely order a new lens. Other things you can think about are maybe trying a new coating like tangible hydropeg. This is a polyethylene glycol coating. It's supposed to be permanent and it really helps prevent um, poor wetting or Contamax new material, Optimum Infinite. This is a hyper DK material with like a 200 DK. But what's amazing about it is that it still has a pretty high modulus. So it's not gonna flex like your usual high DK materials will. And it also boasts a really low wetting angle and it wets really well, even without any special coatings. So this is a material that I've really started to turn towards for my scleral lens wearers with wetting issues or hypoxia issues and things like that. And I've really started coating a lot of my lenses with Hydropeg as well. Okay. Oh yes, it does all of that. Any other questions for today? I think that's the end of our um, lecture. Just kind of going over the basics of scleral lens management, different you know common complications you may run into, and again, just you know remembering that the biggest challenge that your patients tend to face is application and removal, and just keep trying to optimize those fits to solve these problems. Thank you both so much. One question that we we had, which you did kind of touch on, um, but if you don't have an aberometer, you're not able to get aberometry data kind of the best uh, uh, protocol for, for determining eccentricity and then where you kind of start there. Yeah, as Karen said, um, you know, the, the pros, you have a range of options for the, the front surface. And um, where I practice, many practitioners will have lenses um, with a few different front surface eccentricities and really, 
just do a bit of trial and error, measure the visual acuity with the different lenses on eye and get subjective feedback from the patient. Yeah, I do kind of what Steve says, like I will maximize everything, get the fit as you know perfect as I can, make sure there's no flexure, minimal over refraction. If it's still not improving, that's when I'll call a consultant and just ask them to change the eccentricity for me if I don't have aber um, if I don't have an aberration measurement. And then I just tell the patient like, hey, this may not work, but this is kind of my last ditch effort. Or, and you know, optometry is always so scared to refer. Find someone in your community that has an aberrometer and just you know send to them just for the reading. Like we still have people at University of Houston who send to us just for topography and pentacam, and then we happily send them back on their way. Um, and it's the best of both worlds. Well, thank you both so much. Fantastic lecture. Our next webinar for the Sclera Lens Education Society will be on March 14th. Well, there'll be doctors uh, Lynette Johns and Michael Lipson talking about who needs scleral. So expect an email regarding uh, signing up for that. Uh, the next few weeks here, you can also always go to sclerolens.org and register for these uh, along with a lot of other great information. So with that, uh, we'll close out tonight. Thank you again to our presenters. Thank you to everyone who attended, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Drew. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Bye.